make it boring. That's my first endeavor. And I want to make it more interactive and participative. So I would encourage each one of you who's participating today as, as an audience should also be open to send in questions in the chat box and Kavya will support uh, to bring your questions later in uh, this particular discussion. So uh, to start with, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Shikhamitu. I am from India and based out of the national capital of India, New Delhi. I've been working in the space of uh, prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace, specifically for the corporate world and also uh, you know, working towards blue collar and white collar and sensitizing the employees on gender-based violence. And I worked for um, companies and governments and companies like PepsiCo India, Tata Coffee, uh, American Express, to name a few. And today I have eminent personalities from across different countries who would be sharing their work and talking about the very pressing issue of elimination of gender-based violence and harassment. And to start with, uh, you know, I would love to share a bit on the definition under ILO's convention C10, C190. And for the purpose of convention, the term violence and harassment in the world of work refers to a range of unacceptable behaviors and practices or threats thereof, whether a single occurrence or repetitive, or are likely to result in physical, psychological, sexual, or economic harm and includes gender-based violence and harassment. The term gender-based violence and harassment means violence and harassment directed at persons because of their sex or gender or affecting persons of a particular sex or gender disproportionately and includes sexual harassment. So, uh, you know, to, to take it forward from here, I just want to draw your attention on this particular question, why violence and harassment at the workplace are unacceptable. To start with, you would uh, certainly agree to me that it is a right of everyone to a world of work free from violence and harassment of any kind, including gender-based. It also violates human rights and threats the equal opportunity, which is unacceptable and incompatible with decent work. It also uh, compromises the respect and dignity of human being to prevent violence and harassment, and it affects a person's psychological, physical, and sexual health, dignity and family and social environment. At this point in time, we are going to bring in lots of experts we have in the room to open up today's dialogue on elimination of gender-based violence and harassment and share their perspective, their work, uh, share the gaps and also share the solutions that they uh, seem to be fit to apply and reduce and eventually eradicate any gender-based violence and harassment across the world. At this point in time, I would like to introduce our speakers. To start with, I would like to introduce Elena. Hi, Elena. I would like to welcome you here today. And uh, Miss Elena is a decent work in international labor standards specialist with the ILO office for Pacific Island countries in Fiji, covering 11 countries. She's joining the ILO Decent Work team for South Asian Country Office for India in New Delhi soon. Welcome to New Delhi, Elena Soon. I would like to see you in Delhi. And prior to joining the ILO, Elena was an associate professor at the 
Higher School of Economics in Moscow, Russia, was also co-founder and director of the Center for Social and Labor Rights in Russia. Elena also holds a PhD degree in law. Our second speaker today would be Anna. Anna is the director for gender equality activities with International Trade Union Confederation, Asia Pacific, Singapore. Anna is, you know, Anna coordinates the implementation of the ITUC Asia Pacific's platform of action for gender equality, a framework for the organization and affiliates wider policy and action towards the achievement of gender equality in the region. Before joining ITUC AP in 2013, she was with the largest trade union center in the Philippines for more than 10 years in various capacities from organizing training and workers education program, managing development cooperation projects and rendering research and evaluation services on industrial relations. We have also Boa Athu, the director NUSS Asia Pacific. Boa represents NUSS based out of both Sri Lanka and New Zealand. As director of operations in Asia Pacific, he specializes in HR related issues and a keen conser conservationist and social commentator showing a great interest in child labor issues and gender-based employment issues. He's also an advocate for interventionists, strategies as the world comes to terms in a post-COVID era. At this point, I would like to invite Elena to share her perspective on elimination of gender-based violence and harassment and share insights from her side. Welcome, Alina. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, uh, dear colleagues. I'm joining you from the Pacific, as you understand, and uh, really nice to be part of this conversation. I will uh, come to New Delhi in a few months, as I hope and uh, will be much closer. But uh, for now, I think it's also a great opportunity for me to speak from here, from Fiji, because uh, as I will share with you very soon, uh, Fiji was uh, quite a special country uh, for Convention 192 because uh, Fiji was the second country in the world to ratify Convention 190 that happened uh, last year, in May last year. Uh, and the instruments of ratification were deposited to the ILO in June last year. And thanks to Fiji, Convention 190 will enter into force this year, one year after the depositing uh, Fijian instruments of ratification, June 25th this year. And I see uh, my goal uh, during the presentation as a representative of the ILO in sharing uh, and presenting uh, the main uh, points the main um, highlights of the Convention 190 and Recommendation 206 uh, accompanying this convention. And uh, probably uh, I will focus on that, but if uh, we will have further questions, I'll be, of course, happy to discuss. And now I will start sharing uh, the screen with my PowerPoint and hope it works well. So uh, the topic of our uh, discussion uh, of my presentation now will be focused on the presentation of uh, this particular convention. Uh, so on this photo, you see uh, quite a happy moment, a moment when the convention uh, 190 and recommendation uh, 206 were adopted during the International Labor Conference in June 2019. And it was uh, quite uh, an exciting moment. I talked to many people who were at the ILO meeting room uh, in Geneva at that moment, and all the people uh, shared their excitement uh, about adoption of this convention. It was quite a long way uh, towards uh, adoption of the convention because it was discussed by representatives of workers and employers and governments 
of all ILO member states uh, for a number of years. And there were a lot of debates and lots of disputes on uh, how to develop this convention and whether it should be adopted or not. So it was not an easy way, but finally, uh, convention was uh, very well supported during the voting for adoption uh, at their uh, 2019 conference. And uh, thus, uh, almost two years ago, it was uh, adopted. So uh, just uh, briefly uh, to introduce this convention as an ILO instrument. ILO is International Labor Organization, I hope you know that, uh, which uh, unites 187 members. And ILO is unique because uh, it is uh, presented, uh, the countries, member states are presented not by the governments only, but also by workers and employers organizations. International labor standards, including conventions and recommendations, are adopted by the International Labor Conference, which meets annually in June in Geneva. And convention becomes binding for member states only after ratification. It's an international treaty binding uh, member states after ratification by each particular member state. Recommendation just provides uh, guidance in implementing the convention and does not require uh, special ratification. Uh, why Convention 190 is so special? Because it is the first international treaty which recognizes for the first time ever the right of everyone to a world of work free from violence and harassment, including gender-based violence and harassment. And it is uh, adoption of this uh, convention is uh, quite a unique historic opportunity to shape a future of work based on dignity and respect and without violence and harassment. For now, uh, Convention 190 was ratified by three countries. The first country was Uruguay in 2020 uh, in July. The instrument of ratification was uh, deposited. Then uh, Fiji in June, oh, sorry, Uruguay early, it happened in, <laughs> it happened in um, May. Uh, it's my mistake on this slide. Um, uh, in May 2020, the second country was Fiji. Uh, instruments of ratification were uh, deposited in uh, June, 25th June. And as I already mentioned, uh, it was the second ratification which allows convention to come to enter into force uh, in a year from 25th June this year. And uh, the last country for now, the third country for now was Namibia, uh, which deposited instruments of ratification in December 2020. Right now, I know about many countries which are working on ratification and I hope colleagues will also share experiences from their region. From my region in the Pacific, uh, I can tell that uh, Samoa, uh, one of the small island states, uh, is preparing to ratify Convention uh, 190 this year. And two other countries are discussing ratification as well, so probably for the next year. Why this instrument is needed? Uh, I think uh, Shikhar uh, has mentioned some of these arguments already. These are some of the ideas from the preamble to the declaration, to the convention, sorry. Uh, the convention was needed and the International Labor Organization decided uh, that convention should be developed and adopted because uh, violence and harassment in the world of work threatens equal opportunities and unacceptable and incompatible with decent work, uh, which is the key uh, issue of the ILO uh, agenda. And uh, convention recognizes that Violence and harassment in the world of work can constitute a human right violation or abuse. And as mentioned by our uh, moderator today, it can affect persons' health, dignity, family, and social environment. Uh, it can affect uh, quality of public and private policies. It can finally prevent people, especially women, from accessing, remaining and advancing in the labor market. So it is really negative for their professional careers of women, but also sometimes uh, men, not only women and all the people. And uh, of course, uh, what is very important for business because our forum today is about human rights and business. 
uh, violence and harassment in the world of work is incompatible with promoting sustainable enterprises and impacts on workplace relations, enterprise reputation and productivity. So it is, it may have really very negative impacts on business. Um, she has uh, shared the definition from the convention. You can see this uh, definition in the screen again. Uh, so you can see that the definition is quite uh, broad and it defines both uh, elements, uh, violence and harassment uh, at the same time. Uh, it is not very uh, typical situation. Usually we always uh, try to give a special definition to each word uh, in international treaties. But in this case, ILO decided to go for this uh, joint concept of violence and harassment, not to define violence separately, harassment separately. And idea is that each country can define violence and harassment either as a one concept or as a separate concept in national legislation. And uh, there is a special attention given uh, in the convention to gender-based violence and harassment. Again, there were a lot of discussions during the development of the convention, whether uh, gender-based violence should be uh, considered as a separate concept, but then it was considered as part of their broader uh, problem, uh, violence and harassment at work, but with a special focus because, of course, um, gender-based violence uh, constitutes the main problem for majority of uh, working people, and this group of uh, people are women. Uh, I want to emphasize that the scope of uh, this convention is very, very broad. It protects all workers and other persons in the world of work. Uh, we use this term world of work. We do not use the term working uh, workplace. We do not speak about employment relationships uh, because really convention covers all people working uh, irrespectively of their contractual status. And it also covers persons in training it covers those workers whose employment has been terminated. Uh, it covers volunteers, job seekers, and all individuals exercising the authority duties or responsibilities of an employer. Another very important aspect of the convention, very often when we discuss whether the convention can be helpful and useful uh, at national level, uh, people, for example, here in the Pacific, but also in South Asia, quite broadly, raise a concern how convention can help them because the majority of the population, majority of people work in informal economy. Convention addresses uh, gender-based violence and harassment and broadly violence and harassment in all sectors, both informal and in informal economy. So, it requires to provide protection to all working people, including in informal economy, and also in private or public sectors and in urban or rural areas. So when we again uh, speak about the scope of the convention, please pay attention that protection covers uh, violence and harassment, which can occur in the course of, it can be linked to, with, or arise out of work in the workplace, but not only workplace during working hours, but also in such places where workers are paid uh, during work-related trips, travels, trainings, various events, work-related communications, even uh, if these communications are organized uh, through ICT. Uh, in employer provided accommodation and when commuting to and from work. Uh, the core principles of the convention include to respect, promote, and realize the right of everyone to work of, uh, free from violence and harassment. And uh, convention suggests countries to uh, adopt in consultations 
with workers and employers organizations, inclusive, integrated, and gender responsive approach for prevention, elimination of violence and harassment, and taking into account violence and harassment involving third parties. And here you see various um, aspects of the protection, uh, which are listed here on this slide, but which will uh, be uh, discussed a little bit in more details in my further slides, because they are all covered by separate sections uh, and articles of this convention. Uh, what is very important for us, uh, this convention recognizes different but complementary roles and functions of governments, employers, workers, and their respective organizations. And also it includes other organizations and other stakeholders, because of course, protection against violence and harassment is not possible through efforts of only one of these parties. Uh, we cannot say that only governments are responsible for providing this protection. We cannot require only employers to provide this protection. It is really possible only through joint uh, efforts and through uh, discussing and developing joint approach. What is very important, and this is the first uh, rule of the convention, uh, the law at the national level, level or regulations should very clearly define and prohibit, what is important, prohibit, directly prohibit violence and harassment in the world of work, including gender-based violence and harassment. So it is not enough, for example, just to um, suggest uh, some criminal liability or some other measures of liability for violence and harassment you should clearly state in legislation that violence and harassment are prohibited. And uh, employers, uh, we already mentioned a little bit about employers. Employers have very important role, but not uh, the only role in uh, protecting and preventing um, violence and uh, harassment. Uh, they are required uh, to take appropriate step, steps commensurate with the degree of control to prevent violence and harassment, and as far as reasonably practicable to develop a number of uh, policies, for example, workplace policy on violence and harassment, and uh, identify various risks, provide information and training. But again, what is very important for employers and for business, you should understand or they should understand that uh, not full responsibility is uh, imposed on employers. They should take those measures which are relevant to their degree of control to prevent violence and harassment. Also, uh, convention requires to uh, develop and implement enforcement and remedies measures. Uh, this includes uh, monitoring and enforcement appropriate and effective remedies. And you can see the list of possible remedies uh, on the screen. Protection, uh, privacy of individuals involved in uh, cases of violence and harassment. Uh, also, uh, the law should provide for sanctions. And uh, besides that, uh, the state should uh, develop and guarantee safe and effective complaint and dispute resolution mechanisms, support and service and remedies for those who are, have experienced violence and harassment in the world of work. Uh, also, the state should uh, find the way how to remove people from the situations uh, where they face violence and harassment. So for example, the person should have an opportunity to withdraw himself or herself from potentially dangerous situation. And labor inspectors and other relevant authorities should have uh, relevant, again, relevant uh, competency and power to uh, act in these situations. Uh, convention recognizes 
the effects of domestic violence. And I will just go directly to this slide. Uh, what does it mean uh, re to recognize the effect of domestic violence? And what is the connection between domestic violence and world of work? Uh, obviously, domestic violence has an impact, and I think our colleagues may share their experiences. Uh, and very often, uh, employers do not know, or colleagues of uh, workers do not know how to react to the situations when they see that uh, their colleagues or employees uh, suffer from domestic violence, that they experience domestic violence. So convention calls to develop policies and support those workers who face domestic violence. Uh, it requires members to recognize its effects and so far as reasonably practicable, mitigate its impact. So for example, recommendation uh, 206, which is uh, complementing the convention, suggests such measures as leave for victim, victims of uh, domestic violence, flexible work arrangements, temporary protection against dismissal, including domestic violence in workplace uh, risk assessments, awareness rising, and other measures. And finally, uh, both governments and employers uh, and trade unions and uh, workers' organizations should pay attention at development of guidance, trainings, and awareness rising procedures. Because without uh, this type of measures, it's impossible to uh, find the ways to respond uh, violence and harassment. So all the initiatives, including awareness rising campaigns, are very much welcomed and should be jointly developed and coordinated. So thank you very much. I hope uh, this was a helpful introduction and I'm still here to answer questions. Thank you, Alina. Um, Kavya, I, I would like to go back to the screen. Yes, yes. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alina, for sharing such insightful information with all of us. And uh, now I would invite Anna to share her work. You know, you know, Anna, when I spoke to you, I did learn that International Trade Union Confederation uh, represents about 34 countries and, and your you know, scope of work is really vast. Why don't you share uh, some of the gaps, the challenges, and some best practices when it comes to elimination of gender-based violence and harassment and what has been your uh, you know, learnings and everything that you would like to share before we open the room for questions uh, would really invite you to share your perspective. Um, thank you, Shika, and thank you, Elena. I remember the, the photo on the first slide because I was there. Um, I, I was part of the, that historic moment. Uh, it, it was a very intense two-year standard setting uh, process. In fact, um, the environment at the committee level was so intense that when the instrument was finally adopted uh, on the 25th, it was like we don't have the energy anymore to, to even celebrate <laughs> because at the committee level, we exhausted everything. We, we have discussions and negotiations that last until midnight every day. And so just seeing the instrument finally adopted the last day, it was a, a very historic moment because it was adopted in the, the 100th year anniversary of the ILO as well. So being there, being part of that historic moment for me was my first and, and something that I would never forget. Um, just going back to the question, you know what, this is probably my 10th uh, C-190 gender-based violence uh, event or meeting in just the span of two weeks. How, what does that tell you? Um, I don't know for you, but for me, it speaks of the, the extent of, of interest, of excitement even, commitment, engagement of people like us here and many institutions, not just on 
you know, the momentum that that C one hundred and ninety brings, but the the concern that as what Shika and Elena rightly pointed out that there is nothing distant about violence and harassment. And in anyone who would say that, yeah, it's part of the job, seriously, it's not part of anyone's job because that's something that prevents people from really moving forward in their careers. So I'm just happy once again to be part of this. And again, I was, I was in another event just two, two nights ago, two days ago, and that lasted until midnight. But I'm happy to be here because, um, you know, there are challenges. But I think we have more we have more initiatives and more goodness to share with you more than the challenges. So maybe I, I would like to, to share with you know some good news. And then maybe later on um, we can bring our heads together once again, looking at so what are the challenges and how do we move forward? But I just want to give you um, because we don't have so much time, and I don't want Shika to um remove the newly newly uh connections that we've made on linkedin so i'm just really gonna go uh, really really quick on this one but uh, and then i mentioned many elements i wanted to point it out social dialogues is very important social dialogue in fact when 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 c190 was finally adopted it inspired social dialogue in many countries and many organizations even internally within our organization we started to have this conversation about, okay, we don't have a zero tolerance policy about uh, gen of gender-based violence in our own organization. We need to, to have that because as a trade union movement, you need to, to walk the talk. So we started to have that conversation within our organizations initially. And then, then our affiliates started to have constant dialogues with the government. We're looking at three countries which we feel are very ad advanced in the ratification. Uh, we're looking at the Philippines, Bangladesh, and oh gosh, I forgot the other one. Uh, yeah, uh, Indonesia. Just like uh, just like um, I think last week, uh, our team in in Bangladesh had a meeting with the Secretary of the Ministry of Labor, and they received positive commitment the, about ratification of, of the convention. The Philippines is also very advanced. They've already set up a technical working uh, committee that would look and oversee the ratification process. They already completed the, the law and practice analysis. They have done with the consultations and they're looking at expanding the composition of the technical working group into getting the tripartite uh, partners as part of it. So we're looking at these three countries as promising countries that hopefully would have more in addition to, to Samoa. But we're also looking, um, we're also checking with our teams in Samoa and how we can help them, you know, fast track this, this, this process. But the other element that I would like to highlight is something that unions are really good at, and that is collective bargaining agreements. So even in countries where, because aside from Fiji, no one else is ratified in a country, but we are seeing already a lot of unions negotiating to include the language and gender-based violence in C-190 in collective bargaining agreements. I'll tell you one example, really good example, two unions in the Philippines. These are recent unions who just concluded uh, CBA. Uh, it's in the transportation and the cement union. Let me read the language because I feel that the language is so, it's so, um it's so remarkable he said the company shall strictly observe the law on violence against women and their children which is their local law as well as any prospective law on violence and harassment in the workplace that might be enacted in line with ILO convention 9190 within 90 days from the signing of the CBA the company in the union shall start discussions towards the company-based mechanism for raising awareness on domestic violence in the joint preparation of the company manual of procedure for preventive actions, prevention services for workers, and assistance services to victims. You know what? Just looking at this text, there are too many elements in here. They already reflected C-190. Um, they, they would develop a, a robust uh, prevention education work education programs on domestic violence and they would develop a company manual of procedures this is amazing um and and what's so amazing is that even unions have already developed resources they don't even have to start from scratch anymore like i heard from the european transport uh, federation they have developed a manual of procedures that companies can use working with unions can develop a policy and procedure to deal with violence and harassment work the workplace 
this variety of actions, initiatives is happening in the world that is unstoppable faster than we can document them. I tell you, I don't even know what's happening in other countries now because they're just they're just too many initiatives that happen one after another. And, and I want to share another example from Mongolia. We did a study on domestic violence. For, for me, this is something very, very close to my heart because I was part, uh, we did the ITCAP, we did several uh, studies on domestic violence in countries like Mongolia, the Philippines, and Taiwan in 2015 and 2017. We're, we tried to look at the impact, and as Elena Wright said, there is really a clear impact of domestic violence and work, workplace and workplaces. And we did these studies in three countries then. But what the unions did is they used the findings of the study to, of course, integrate the language in the collective bargaining agreement, which they did. But at the same time, they negotiate with the government to include the unions in the composition of what they call domestic violence action groups. These are uh, government bodies at different levels in their country that would look and address uh, domestic violence. So now they're using the findings of the study. Unions are, are putting it into collective bargaining and now unions are involved um, in, in addressing domestic violence. And just last one point. You know, we are not just doing collective bargaining, we're not just doing workplace education, but unions also provide, and I think very fundamental, provide services and programs to their own members. So in the case of, of KSPI in Indonesia, for example, and uh, PWF in Pakistan, and in, in Israel, they had set up health tests, um, health lines, and they also have shelter that provides directed uh, assistance and services to victims of domestic violence. And just last week, I heard that uh, tens of thousands of workers in Israel stopped their work for 10 minutes all over the country just to, to, to highlight the problems of uh, increasing domestic violence in the country, which has exploded to about 91% during the pandemic. So I'm going to stop here for now. We, have, we still have so much to share, but really, I don't want to let go of the friendship that I have with Chica on LinkedIn. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Anna, for such insightful uh, information that we got from you. And of course, I'm going to open the room for all of you to come and share more perspective and I'm going to put a lot of questions for all of you but before that I'm going to invite uh, Boa uh, who said something so interesting when I was having a conversation with him uh, he said uh, you know doing things right and doing the things doing the right things these two things when he said it really resonated with me and I want uh, Boa to come forward and share his experience of, uh, you know, work in the space of elimination of uh, gender-based violence and harassment, and and of course share a little bit of perspective on, uh, you know, in in this particular region which is Sri Lanka, and if uh, he wants to extend his particular, uh, you know, region anywhere ahead of that, you're most welcome, Boa. Well, thank you very much, Shika, and uh, a very good afternoon, evening. Uh, uh, Ayubon and Kiora, wherever you are, I feel very privileged to be on this forum as the, looks like the only male participant. Um, so yeah, feel very, very honored and privileged. Look, uh, absolute uh, flood of knowledge there, some very precise, accurate points made on Article C-190 by my two esteemed colleagues. So um, again, I thank you for that. That was very well articulated, very well presented, some solid points and some solid case studies on uh, action, action rather than words. So to answer your question, um, Shika, um, one of my areas of uh, particular interest is to look at um, legislation and um, uh, action where you know there are interventionist policies and look at simplifying it and give clarity to all stakeholders so one of the one of the key areas i've been working on especially in um, in sri lanka where we have had uh, uh, you know uh, a, a history of this gender based violence it's very rife uh, so one of one of my key areas i have really looked at is to take what we call an education based uh, management of this issue. So bringing uh, interventionist strategies based on education, simplifying what is encapsulated in Article C-190 and putting in place 
very simple strategies which can be executed pretty much uh, at an individual level. And one area I, I, I take a lot of interest in is trying to eradicate what I would uh, specifically call the audit culture. Now, this is nothing new uh, uh, to, to most of us where large corporates and employers, for the sake of getting the tick in the box, making sure that they pass their audit, they, they put on this uh, facade, it's, it's, a, it's a cover front, uh, and they don't actually mean what they do. So that, that's why yesterday, during our brief conversation, um, it, was, it was very late here in New Zealand, uh, I did, I did make, make the point that we as humans, we need to make sure that we do the right thing, not do things right. Now, there's a very subtle difference in the words I use. But by doing the right thing, by actually embracing and absorbing uh, everything which has been stated in Article C-190, um, what NUSS as the forefront or the pioneer um, trade union in Sri Lanka, which has really pushed the case of Article C-190, and uh, what, you know, one of the actions we took was last year, um, year 2020, we undertook a very comprehensive gap analysis and uh, that's something I will share with the panel later on. Uh, you know, we, we found a, a lot of traces, a lot of uh, evidence to suggest from employers that there was very much an audit culture present. And they were, it was almost like they were using C-190 for a, a, a false um, public relations front. Uh, so the gap was actually educating, simplifying what is in Article C-190, engaging with some of the key stakeholders and making sure it's an employee-employer uh, collab or a, or a you know, uh, uh, employee-employer driven initiative and putting into place strategies which are, which are very simple to execute. Uh, so, you know, we've been working on um, strategies such as making very simplistic resources available, um, also educating some of the younger workers, educating some of the, uh, uh, the leaders at workplaces, um, going into large workplaces and getting uh, focus groups from the trade unions, educating them and taking that education to HR departments. And uh, one such uh, instance was SAGT, which is a very large corporate, the uh, South Asia, uh, a big part, the, uh, the gateway terminal, the, uh, it's, it's one of the largest uh, uh, freight processing arms at the Colombo port. Um, you know, we had a we had a four member team which we educated on some of these uh, very simplistic strategies, and they then took it to the HR department. And I, I, I'm very very pleased to say that uh, the uh, the board actually came back and said that we're we're going to incorporate this uh, in a policy document, and we are actually going to make it compulsory in our employee induction program. So that was, uh, that was a huge moment of triumph for us because it, it completely validated that the educationist policy uh, and the strategic move going forward. And also I can, I can say, um, as of yesterday, the Minister of Labor for Sri Lanka has now confirmed that they will be ratifying Article C-190 in Sri Lanka. So that's a huge moment. And um, looking at some of those pictures of uh, uh, Anna and Elena, I, I, I hope, I, I, I only hope and pray that I too can share something similar in the coming months ahead, because obviously there's a process involved once this is presented to parliament. We are doing everything we can to lobby this to be passed as quickly and painlessly as possible, because um, as our colleagues have mentioned prior to this, uh, it is everyone's right to feel safe at work. And, uh, you know, uh, gender-based violence and harassment is completely and utterly unacceptable in anyone's world. So those are some of the insights. Very briefly, I would like to uh, share with all of us and uh, I'll hand over the microphone to you, Shika. All right, great to hear all these, you know, brilliant initiatives. And thank you to all three of you. At this point in time, 
of course, I'm going to uh, ask some tough questions and open the room and we'll let Elena, Anna and Boa to choose uh, to answer. And I'm not going to put you in on a spotlight, but would let you choose who would like to answer first. So my first fundamental question to all of you today, while we're talking about elimination of gender-based uh, violence and harassment, what are some key initial drivers for gender-based violence? Any thoughts on this? Uh, you know, I would like all three of you to share your perspective one by one, but anyone can initiate the answer. What are the, you know, what can be the first initial driver for, you know, violence? Any thoughts on it, uh, Anna, Alina, and, and Boa? Maybe I can start? Yes, yes, absolutely, Anna. Although I will not tell you the drivers, but because I think everybody knows that already, but I, what I will tell you is give you some answers. <laughs> Because I have so many answers, like we are we are fix, we are fixing what what's what's wrong. Uh, for example, um, unequal power relations. Well, that's that's really one of the drivers of it. So so how we how are we doing it? Women's leadership. That's that's fundamental for us. Um, trade unions have always been very male dominated, and we tried to fix it for so long. It it was you know it was so slow. But then we managed to to bring so much changes and and C one ninety is in fact the the result of that change because if we didn't have women in trade unions I don't think we'll ever have this this instrument it was the women the women union we know already have a women's movement within the trade union movement itself they are the ones who pushed who influenced who who who, who has driven this 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 process we've been fighting for this for a decade and it happened because of this women and this is what we're still doing it we have a new project in southeast asia this is another good example so we have a new project on specifically on building women and leadership in south asia but not just women but young women so what we're hearing is when we ask this women so what what is your priority uh what is important for you and we always get, we want to have a future world of work without gender-based violence. It's very loud and clear. So as part of this project, when we started building the leadership of these women, and suddenly we are seeing, you know, accomplishments, collective bargaining agreements, memorandum of agreements led and, and driven by these women on gender-based violence. That's amazing. And so we thought, okay, so this is our cue. We're starting in Southeast Asia, but we should not stop here because there's still so much that we can do, particularly in South Asia. <laughs> and I think, and I think this is where we need we need a lot of help. And I I, I see that my friend uh, Nishi here, we're also collaborating. This is something again that I would like to highlight um, is that we are building on what's already out there. We do not start from scratch. We do not duplicate what's already happening because it doesn't make sense. Limit resources are limited. We have so many, so many equally important uh, initiatives and, and you know uh, tasks that we need to to attend as well. So like Nishi, uh, she's leading the the South Asia Gender Platform, and so we are collaborating with them. So they're they're looking at C one ninety also as one of of their priority, and of course looking at the broader gender gender issues as a women in leadership so i think just Brilliant. one question very long very long answer to a very short question great great no so what's your perspective uh elena on this what can be the key driver you know for violence to happen well, uh, violence is very deeply rooted in many cultures, unfortunately. Violence at various levels, because countries have, in different regions, have very different history and background. Some countries have uh, a lot of wars for many decades, and it's really difficult in some regions to, you know, change their attitude, to, to change the culture. And, of course, when violence is becoming part of the life, it is... Like, how can you change it in just one sphere at work? In many countries, the patriarchal relationships are also so deeply rooted and include and accept this uh, violence uh, as a 
part of relationships and consider it as a normal part of relationships. Again, so you cannot uh, behave differently when you just live from your own house. You, you are not becoming a different person. You are still staying the same person. And I think for very long time, probably never uh, for during the 20th century, 21st centuries, we discussed these issues of violence or gender-based violence or domestic violence with children at schools or at the universities or part of the educational programs or awareness rising programs because like we didn't, okay, we discussed uh, of course uh, wars and post-war uh, situations and traumas, etc. but not really gender-based violence and home violence. So it is something what is uh, happening last few decades only and our mentality is changing so slowly. So you need to get this as part of your education from your family, from your school, etc., etc. And of course it is changing very slowly. So of, that's why, for example, convention pays a lot of attention to awareness rising, not to only trainings, which can be organized by employers, for example, or by governments, but very broad awareness rising campaigns. Here, for example, we have undertaken a few reviews and also developed recommendations to countries. And what we suggest to all the countries that uh, relevant programs should be included into school programs. They should be uh, part of various, family uh, life pro programs promoted by ministries of women, uh, ministries of health, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, an, it should be integral part of our uh, life, uh, not just uh, law or regulation, which should be implemented by particular state or particular employer. So it should be really everywhere around us to change the situation. Whoa, that was, uh, that was a very interesting uh, answer, Elena. Boa, what's your perspective on what can be the key driver for violence? Hey, look, uh, one of the key, uh, you know, the, the, one of the key ugly heads which raise uh, violence as a driver. Uh, I'm, I'm going to build on what Elena was saying. It's 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 a very dark underbelly fabric of uh, cultures, you know, um, now specifically to Sri Lanka, I mean, we've, we've just come out of a, a, a very brutal and bloody 30 plus year civil war. There's a lot of uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, sufferers, and this leads to alcohol abuse, um, drug abuse. And of course, this acceptance that it's okay to use violence, which it is not. Um, and there's a significant lack of actually openly talking about this issue in a grown-up manner. However, over the last few years, uh, with the advent of social media, um, you know, videos, people talking about this openly has come to the foray. And we can see some of the younger people in the younger generations taking a stand against uh, things like domestic violence. So my approach to this is... has just like with any pressing issue, is an education-based issue. So um, the answer to this is, you know, uh, I'm just going to digress a little bit from your question because it's, I think it's important that I go over this, especially from a, in, in, you know, interventionist strategy. You need to have a very clear and a very simple strategy for the short term, medium term, and long term, which I call the transitional uh, strategy. So Imagine we, uh, some of our younger kids in that 18 to 22 bracket who are very old, who are receptive to this, who, who say it's not okay to resort to violence. Uh, they get educated in a, in a manner which that they can then take it to their friends, their families. Uh, and as time passes, we're talking eight, 10, 12 years from now, we will have a generation where they will clearly take a stand against this sort of violence and harassment saying, you know what? It's not okay. And I think that's what we really need to look at because yes, you know, mandating legislation and having harsh punitive uh, measures in most cases are required. There's no question about it. I have, I have zero sympathy and I have no time for, for people who resort to violence thinking that is a solution for whatever problem they perceive. But the reality is we have to come and have a dialogue, you know, in an open, mature way 
where sometimes you know it, it is very uncomfortable it, we will have to confront some of our some of our family some of our friends and say you know what's going on what can we do to break this vicious cycle and by doing that more people uh, you know that awareness will lead to that dialogue where what uh, legislation can't do i mean you know we can't mandate people to love each other we can we can we can put preventative measures in place but the reality is by actually openly talking about it and understanding where the crux, crux of the problem is in in this instance which i go back to the answer to your question which is that dark fabric of an underbelly of a culture where most people actually don't want to accept and die in denial that there is a problem. So we need to openly talk about it. Um, and I think Elena has pretty much laid out the law as far as how you need to approach this. And I'm 100% with her. We need an education-based, intelligence-based solution, which is long-term. It's not a, not a Band-Aid or a plaster, uh, or it's, it's not a slap on the wrist. It's, it's got to be where people are actually willing to have an open discussion and immerse themselves in the right answer. Absolutely. Brilliant. I mean, a great insight. And I, I, I also have a perspective that I would like to share with all of you. How about uh, pondering over this aspect of biases that we all develop with the due course of our experiences from our past, from our geographical locations? How about uh, I would like to actually share a video with all of you on biases before uh, we go into this kind of discussion. Why don't we just go and have a look to this video and then open a dialogue on biases. Unconscious mind is amazing. It can process vastly more information than our conscious mind by using shortcuts based on our background cultural environment, and personal experiences to make almost instantaneous decisions about everything around us. The snag is, it's wrong quite a lot of the time, especially on matters that need rational thinking. Here's a classic example. A bat and a ball cost one pound ten pence. If the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Most people including over 50% of students at some of the world's leading universities, get the answer wrong and say 10 pence. The answer is actually 5 pence. Many of us choose 10 pence without thinking. This is because our unconscious mind uses instinct, not analysis. So our unconscious is fallible. It's also biased. It makes snap judgments of people we meet categorizing them according to gender, social, and other characteristics. In milliseconds, we judge whether somebody is like us and belongs to our in-group. These are the people we favor. So men might favor men, while women might favor women. However, we can belong to different in-groups, and we like to be part of an in-group that's powerful, which could mean a woman favoring a man over a woman. That's unconscious bias. All of us have it, and it colors our decisions without our realizing. For example, research reveals that if I were a man, you would be more likely to be nodding in agreement right now because people pay more attention to a male voice. The Royal Society fosters excellence in science, but this can only be achieved if we select from the widest range of talent. And that's not possible if unconscious bias is narrowing down the field for non-scientific reasons. To lessen the impact of unconscious bias, which is easier for us to notice in others, we are raising the awareness of unconscious bias to members of our selection and appointment panels. We're encouraging panel members to deliberately slow down decision-making, reconsider reasons for decisions, question cultural stereotypes, and monitor each other for unconscious bias. We can't cure unconscious bias, but with self-awareness, we can address it. All right. So, um, how about you all share your perspective on unconscious biases playing a role 
in uh, gender-based violence. What's your take on it, Alina? Well, you know, uh, before you started this video, I saw that there is something else what I wanted to share to amend our previous discussion about uh, the root causes and uh, why it is all happening. And uh, I think now uh, a lot of people are G, um, sharing their own experiences and attitude, etc. And, you know, I just wanted to tell you, I'm coming from Russia. And um, what I can tell you, we have in Russia, we have no any legislation and no, almost no any awareness about uh, the negative impact of violence and harassment, including sexual violence and harassment, including in the world of work. Uh, <laughs> though Russia is a very well developed country, like the level of understanding and awareness on this issue, I think even comparing to the to Pacific countries or South Asia is very low. And you know, it is even now it is difficult for us to have discussions. For example, for me back uh, in my country with my colleagues uh, on these issues on violence and harassment at work. Until now, people do not really understand whether sexual harassment at work is normal or not. And I can tell you, a lot of people are still sure that this is natural, this is normal, this is part of the culture. And well, a lot of people publicly would defend the views that, well, if, for example, sexual harassment between professor and students, this is normal practice. What? It always existed during 20th century or second half of 20th century. What is strange is that it is part of their, uh, you know, public agreement and acceptance uh, that, like, for example, between high level officials and journalists coming for interview or people who are part of their uh, artistic uh, performance uh, uh, sectors like th this is normal that a lot of people are still sure that uh, if you choose this type of profession you already accept and agree to this type of relationship and this type of attitude you know it is so much deeply rooted and as uh, Bohr uh, mentioned unless you start discussing and critically rethink everything what is happening unless the number, the amount, and the level of these critical discussions and people around you who help you to rethink the attitude is increasing. People do not even understand that something negative is happening to them, to them personally, even if it is happening to them. A lot of people are probably, a lot of women would probably blame themselves and the society would blame women in this type of relationship. We are still in this uh, type of the society which consider this uh, relationships normal. Of course, how we can move from there. We, we really need so much uh, efforts to speak about that, uh, about to, to discuss this, to raise awareness, to have this education programs, to develop policies. We have to do so much still from now to change the attitude, uh, attitude in a broad public, you know, not in a small groups of people who really think in a lot and have good understanding of the problem and of the situation, but among all the people, among broad groups in the society. So we have so, so long way forward. Um, and of course, uh, all this attitude is part of this unconscious bias, which you mentioned. Absolutely. So I totally, totally uh, hear you. And of course, it's uh, very deeply uh, rooted in people and it cannot be dealt with, with just some initiatives we all collectively across the world will have to do very deep interventions to have really uh, bring about that change that we all are looking to see. And um, uh, what's your take on this, Boa. Uh, uh, sorry, Boa, you've already spoken about it, right? Um, so, so I think Alina 
Anna, Anna, have you spoken about it? On the bias? No, and I have some things to share. Yeah, yeah. if that's yeah. okay. I have something to share about. I think this is very important. We always say that family is a very important unit in society to, to develop, to, to motivate, build positive uh, behaviors among people. But let's look at uh, areas where we, as institutions, as a trade union movement, for example, can do something about it. Because we cannot fix all the problems in the world, but I think we can start somewhere, right? So as a trade union movement, what we're doing is uh, externally through our unions um, with some of the unions managed to include labor rights into the curriculum. I can mention a university in the Philippines uh, as part of the project that I mentioned earlier about building women and leadership. The women and youth representatives who are part of the project, one of the things that they did once again is to negotiate with their employer because she is from a, an academic academy to include labor rights into the curriculum for the senior high school. And they started that last year and they will start it again. So see, there are so many things that we can do. So just focus for now on, on, on those areas where we, we have control. The other one is internally at the workplace level. I think this is very important to challenge behaviors, to say, no, this is, this is not right. And so this is what, what the workers and unions are doing as well. So our work, workers' education are no longer talking about, okay, so women and, and, and men. But when we talk about gender equality, we'll say women and, and the men are all in this together. We are partners to building a world of work without gender-based violence. A very simple case, a very simple example of, okay, the story of the two frogs. I always use this for our workplace education program. So the story of two frogs, and you have to say which, which one went to the door. Is it a male or a female? And just like the, the example that you showed in the video earlier. So this kind of case studies that you integrate in the workplace education program, and people get to think, okay, so what should be the answer? And the always answer is, or it's a male because the male is, is brave. But in, once you include these conversations into workplace education, people really think and internalize, okay, this is not right. And then the, the application. So how do you apply this, this knowledge? And I wanted to go back to what Ritu was saying because it's really heartbreaking just reading what Ritu is, is, is saying about the experience of someone in, um, uh, someone she knows so he knows in, in Nepal who was who experienced um, harassment and had to leave the job. And I was telling Rito that we had a similar example of a home-based worker. The employer uh, kept har uh, harassing her and, and she said, no, what you're doing is not right. And because of the union, she was able to, to stop the employer from harassing. And at the same time, the employer started giving the, the wage which is required under the law. So what I'm saying is that it's important to have a voice. In fact, all people have voices, but we, you know, uh, at some point in time, uh, we forget that we just need people and a part of the institutions for you to really discover that voice. And the union gave her that voice. And so this is what we're doing in Pakistan now. Uh, our unions in Pakistan will develop a company procedure. They call it a redressal mechanism. So when people experience uh, harassment from anyone, from, from co-workers or, or the, the management, they would report to this, to this committee, to this body, which understands what gender-based violence, what gender uh, equality is all about. So there's so many, many uh, initiatives that we can do. And I think moving forward, we're very happy to connect the organizations who are participating in this event and do something together yeah brilliant thank you uh, thank you so much uh, anna so of course i mean there are so many perspectives there's so many uh, you know inputs that we got on biases and other inputs that we got from elena boa and anna i would now uh, of course invite questions from all of you in the room and uh, there's one question that we've already received from dr rajesh gopal and his question is what is the status in the process of ratification of um, convention in India and what potential ro role can be played by the ILO, ILO India office and other stakeholders, governmental and NGO partners? So I would like Elena to 
uh, you know, answer this particular question. Alina, can I invite you for this answer? Yes, sure. Thank you very much for this question. Well, uh, I'm not absolutely sure because I'm still not in India. What is the stage uh, right now uh, with discussing the ratification in India? Probably, Shikha, you can even mention something about that. Yeah, I understand you are involved. Uh, as I know from my colleagues, uh, they indicated that there is an interest in India to discuss ratification and probably move towards the ratification. So how ILO, ILO of course welcomes uh, as many ratifications as possible. We will be happy to achieve universal ratification of this convention, meaning like if all the ILO members would ratify it. Uh, so what we can do and how we can help. First, we are uh, developing uh, promotion and awareness rising materials. Uh, and I hope our we will have general materials on uh, Convention 190 and special materials for employers, for workers, for governments, helping to understand the content and how they can implement. Because, for example, there are a lot of concerns from employers' side because they very often, from our conversation, uh, our discussions, they very often feel that all the responsibility is on employers only. That now employers will have, in case of ratification, will have to guarantee uh, the absence of sexual harassment to their employees wherever employees are. But no, it, it is not as this. Uh, it is, as I mentioned already, a joint responsibility and joint efforts of different groups, including employers, but also government, civil society organizations, trade unions play a huge, very important role in this process. So we are developing all this um, awareness and rising and supporting material is helping to achieve ratification to, to understand the convention. Uh, then we are uh, also, there, there are a lot of already developed materials and we are working now to prepare more materials uh, of the type which Anna has mentioned, various guidelines, training materials. I, I, I should mention there is a training on convention 190 launched by the ILO International Trade uh, ITC, International Training Center in Turin. The training will start in a month in April. So if you are interested to know more about this convention, I can share the link and information about this training. So you can attend this six weeks uh, course, which will help to understand how to implement convention, how to draft all various uh, regulations and uh, what to do to implement convention uh, at, at the national level. In many countries ILO is supporting uh, legal gap analysis but for example in Sri Lanka uh, constituents volunteered and organized this uh, legal gap analysis themselves it was their own initiative but we are supporting in some countries so this can be discussed and then a number of conversation national level or regional level discussions can be supported by ILO and ILO will be always happy to present to um, uh, to raise awareness, to present convention, answer questions, etc. So, of course, all this uh, support related to promotion and ratification and further implementation of the convention, development of uh, regu draft regulations, draft laws, etc. All these uh, things may be supported by the ILO either through various reviews or comparative analysis, organization of conferences and discussions. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing this. And of course, um, you know, like you said that I've, I'm, I'm involved, I would like to share what's happening in India. So 2013, I started BRC, and it's a company which is uh, raising awareness on prevention of sexual harassment. When I started back in 2010, in 2010, there was no law. Uh, there were only guidelines by uh, by the country, which were called Vishakha guidelines. And when I started uh, raising awareness in 2010, in spite that there were no, uh, you know, there was not a specific law, which came into picture in 2013. So in 2013, there's Prevention Prohibition Redressal Act of, um, uh, you know, sexual harassment of women at the workplace, the act of 2013 that came into play. After that law came in, which is already seven years, uh, the government and the corporates are of course talking about it. But like Boa shared with us that every organization needs to uh, go beyond the audit culture 
And in India, very few organizations have, uh, uh, you know, an attitude beyond audit culture. And I am very uh, happy to share that I have worked with some of the very uh, progressive organizations. And I would like to show you one of such uh, you know, projects that I have delivered Pan India in 14 locations to raise the awareness on prevention of sexual harassment. Uh, Kavya, I would like to uh, get your support on that. This was, a, this was a typical project that we've been rolling out across India with multiple corporates and government bodies and raising awareness using local street theater format where a lot of people who do not understand English, they understand what they need to know from their employers in their local languages through an act of theater. So this is how we've been doing, Alina, and uh, to, to share that in India, government may have come up with the law, which is Prevention, Prohibition, Redressal Act of 2013, but very few employers are uh, very serious about raising awareness and preventing the uh, sexual harassment at their workplaces. And a lot of other organizations are doing it as a tick in the box. And this particular attitude needs to be changed immediately and urgently to have a universal ratification. It's also one of the attitudes that we need to talk about uh, whenever we are going and talking to any kind of organizations across the world. And that's um, my input over here on this particular aspect. So we are about 10 minutes to close the today to today's conference. But uh, before that, I would like to invite Two more questions because we have that much time. And we have uh, one more question that I already have received. Uh, yes, uh, please, Boa, would you like to say something before I go ahead? I, I, I very much would like to say something. Just so building on what you said, um, you know, we, we as educators or making people aware, we need to understand at the core face at ground level, we have some barriers where, um, actually having jargon heavy, as you rightly showed on that presentation, it is quite off-putting and, and it actually uh, drives fear into um, employees. So I think it's really important that we figure out uh, a very simple, uh, clear message in whatever medium it works in. And you've clearly highlighted uh, the use of street theater. So um, it's, it's really important that when the message goes across to those people who are suffering the most, it's put in a manner that they can actually connect uh, without fear or favor, and that they can actually be part of this whole process. Um, otherwise, in, in my view, most of these interventionist uh, you know, strategies are actually quite ineffective because sometimes we get so hung up uh, on what we're doing 
And we tend to make the assumption that most of this legislation, the way it has been put forth or written is actually understood by people who have little to no idea where literacy rates and the ability to understand what is actually being said is next to nothing. Brilliant, brilliant. Absolutely, I'm with you on that. So thank you so much for, for coming in and, and sharing this. And um, then the next question is again for Elena. Uh, the question is that is the ILO planning on mar marking 25th June when C190 takes legal effect with any public event? Um, that's the question, Elena. Yes, we are discussing that we will definitely need to organize some kind of uh, awareness rising and some kind of special event to launch their moment of entrance into force for this convention and at the same time use it as their uh, opportunity to promote uh, convention more at high level. And actually we are trying to prepare some of those materials which I mentioned by that de de deadline and also some promo videos, etc. But yes, we will. Uh, we are planning to organize something. So I hope we'll be able to inform you in a while what what will be done. Definitely, something will be done. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. So, do we have uh, any more questions? It was um, okay. Can, can I just share one more comment? I have uh, sent the link to this course, ILO ITC. Uh, course on ending violence and harassment in the world of work. So you can find it a little bit if you scroll up uh, in the chat. Uh, and uh, so you, you have to pay for this course, but I'm not sure, I didn't check what is the price. But if you are working with some workers or employers organizations or with the government, uh, so with ILO constituents, you can uh, contact us and probably we, we do have sometimes scholarships for uh, constituents, but also I think it would be possible to look for various ways to fund these scholarships if you want to attend, interested to promote the convention but cannot pay for yourself. So you can also contact ILO office in your respective country for this. Brilliant. So uh, everyone in the room please contact ILO in case you're unable to fund this particular training and make sure that you go and at least read about it, take more information from the site. Uh, just in case you have missed out the link, I'm sharing the link with everyone again here. It's right in the chat box. And um, we have very few minutes left at this point. I would like to say a few words before we close. Today, we've talked about elimination of gender-based violence, um, you know, and harassment. And it's, it's not just about violence and harassment. It's a people issue. It's human rights issue. And why, uh, why we are even talking about violence and harassment, let's ponder over this, this thought that Today, if we all together work towards making sure that everyone around us is treated and should be treated as humans before they are, they are treated as genders, before they are treated as uh, with, with their age seniority or skills or uh, any other diverse set of groups that they belong to. How about treating them as humans before anything? specifically gender, that will uh, eliminate a lot of situations which we all are facing when it comes to gender-based violence. How about opening up a dialogue on making sure to treat humans as humans before treating humans as gender? At this point in time, I would like all of you to think about it and write to me if if you wish to, I'm very much available for all of you to talk about the topic on elimination of gender-based violence and harassment. And my LinkedIn was shared um, above. If you want, I would again share it. Uh, Kavya, I would need your support. If you would like to, um, if any one of you like to share any of your thoughts, would like to connect with me, uh, with any of the speakers, you're most welcome to please write to us and uh, Kavya can share my, my details here. And after that, I would be happy to connect any one of you 
to Elena, Boa, and Anna for any more insights on this particular topic. But thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights. Elena, Boa, and Anna, I am really, really thrilled today to have you all to speak about your experiences, your knowledge, and your perspective on this particular pressing topic that needs to be addressed urgently. Thank you so much to all of you. Alina, Boa, and Anna, would you like to share your last few words? Yeah, look, guys, a uh, quick shout out. Uh, hopefully, year 2021, we'll see Sri Lanka ratify Article C-190. And we look forward <laughs> to Sri Lanka being one of the first five countries in the world to ratify Article C-190. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> and and Boa, if, if, if um, you, you know, as I said earlier, we're very open to collaborating with as many organizations as possible. So I shared my, my email address earlier in the chat box. So just feel free to contact me anytime. Yeah, that's it. Elena. Yes, and I saw that some people were asking for the PowerPoint. I will change the slide about ratification and share it after the presentation. And uh, please, uh, I kindly ask Shikhar to share with or help to share with all the participants and there is my email address at the last slide. And when I was listening to you about your enthusiasm, I heard this enthusiasm and I thought that, wow, probably we really can think about universal ratification of Convention 190, you know? And uh, after what Anna, I, I, you know, I started thinking about the role of women and uh, women in trade union movement that only after strengthening that uh, women's uh, trade union movement and the women's role and trade union women, the adoption of this uh, convention uh, became possible. And I, start think I started thinking that, wow, probably the women can become so strong that they could really impose their important for women agenda on this violence and harassment worldwide in all different countries. So it's I, I'm full of hope after our conversation. <laughs> That's really nice. And to Boa's uh, optimistic announcement, I also want to share with all of you that, that I'm already working with ILO India and trying my best to ratify Convention 190 in India. I'm not too sure on 2021, but I'm certain that by 2022, I have moved desks in the government and in the corporate world enough for, um, for me to also make sure that we ratify uh, in India as well before the December of 2022, Boa. That's my, that's my you know, anticipation. Thank you, I'm, Anna. I'm, I'm sure it will come to fruition with your persuasion. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Before the minute ends and the conference time ends, I would like to again thank you all of you and ILO, UN, and every organizer involved. Special thanks to our technical team for uh, helping us to seemingly uh, execute this conference and conversation. I loved every bit of it. Thank you so much and have a good day or a good evening to all of you. Bye from me. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.